You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Accounted For. Happy Wednesday. Um, yeah, thanks for joining again. <laughs> If you're new, welcome. Welcome to the podcast that's on a mission to expand your perspectives, have you question the default option, and get inspired to action for your own career. So before we hit the episode today, uh, you, know, you regulars know the drill. This podcast is brought to you by OMD Ventures, my platform focused on human capital investing. You can find all my weekly content on omdventures.com from the weekly newsletter, article, podcast, and vlog. And if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, you are missing out. And there actually will be some changes coming up shortly, depending on how much time I dedicate to it. But yeah, so it's better to sign up earlier now before the new changes come in. But, you know, I'll leave that up to you. So. Other than that, um, oh yeah, I have descriptions for all the stuff in the, I mean, sorry, I meant I have links and (laughs) I have links for all the, the, all the different things like subscribing the vlog and all that in the descriptions of the podcast and, you know, help, help other podcasts. Tell your friend about it. You have a friend who's struggling about their career. Um, just refer them to the podcast and recommend some episodes that you liked and help that friend out (laughs) and also leave a review uh if you really enjoyed it that really helps as well and we can have someone you don't know listen on the podcast and have their life positively impacted as well okay so that's enough for announcements today's guest is sagar mali sagar is the co-founder of switchboard a fleet management marketplace company based out in vancouver british columbia you know talk about a flashback to the past because sagar and i went to high school together and we reconnected for the first time in nine years last christmas when i was back in vancouver visiting family and friends and sagar and his uh, switchboard team had just been admitted to the esteemed startup incubator y combinator and he connected. We we connected together in Toronto after his three month stint in San Francisco to really just dive through his journey and also learn about what it was like in Y Combinator. And so we have our second perspective. The first one having been Vikram, who was a much earlier guest, um, talk about who talked about his Y Combinator experience as a founder. And so Sagar's entrepreneurial journey started right after university. After working in a lot of top tech firms like Apple, Intel, and BlackBerry, where he did a number of the co-ops and internships in. And we talk about the role of a hardware versus software engineer, because I don't know the difference, but he's done both. So we shed light into that. Um, We also talk about the decision to not pursue the lucrative path in the big tech firms, because it just seems like that's what most people want. Most people want to go get a job at Apple. Like they'd die for it if they're a software engineer, but Sega chose not to pursue that. So we talk about his mindset behind that. I also learned about his short romance for Wall Street quant trading. <laughs> and so we'll talk about his little foray there and how instead of pursuing that, he ended up pursuing the startup world. And then we go in depth into more of the trials and tribulations of building a startup just pre and post Y Combinator if there really was a difference and just what it really was like just building Switchboard for the last four years, the pivots he had to take and just why he does what he does. And so I really, I honestly, this is a super fun chat and it's, it was also kind of me and Sega just kind of sometimes walking down memory lane, trying to reference back to our Vancouver roots as well. So I, you know, I hope my chat with Sega really helps you out and helps you expand your perspective and has you question the default and it hopefully also inspires action as well. And so without further ado, here's my chat with Sagar. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today on the podcast, we have Sagar Mali. Hey Sagar, thanks for coming on the podcast. 
Yeah, no worries, man. It's uh, nice to be in Toronto. Nice to reconnect and, and check base. Yeah. So Sagar here is the co-founder of Switchboard. And so Sagar, for our listeners who don't know what your company does, can you tell us more about Switchboard? What do you guys do? And you know, how are you guys different from what the incumbents were or any other competitors? For sure. Um, so Switchboard is a freight marketplace built on using real-time information so that we can connect shippers directly with truck drivers. Um, you know, I think the way we kind of differentiate is we have built software for trucking companies that they love to use and they use on a daily basis, right? So when you kind of typically look at marketplaces, you think of the chicken and the egg problem, right? You go to a shipper and they want to see truck drivers on board. You go to truck drivers and they want to see shippers on board. So when we really started to solve this problem, you know, we thought about how we could tackle this from a unique perspective that was efficient. Right? We just don't want to throw money at the wall saying, hey, we'll just keep going after shippers, keep going after truckers, and eventually we'll get to a point where you know, everyone has enough on board. Um, I don't think that works, and I think that's you know, just pure attrition at that point. So what we did was we had just identified things that trucking companies needed in their day-to-day. So in our case, it was compliance software. And we just built compliance software for the last couple of years, and that's all we, you know, that's all we sold them with no promise of a marketplace. And I think now we're starting to get to that point where we have the liquidity where we can go to shippers and say, hey, we have all these trucking companies on board that love our software that use it up to you know 15 hours a day each. So give us your freight and we can help you get good rates, find the right driver for the right job. Oh, okay. Wow. And so when you say compliance, um, I'm thinking, is it uh, the economy is thinking, is it like legal compliance or <laughs> yeah. what was compliance for the trucking companies? So it is legal compliance. Gotcha. Um, basically, the software that we created, um, not ours specifically, but the problem we were solving ended up being federally mandated in the U.S. So every single commercial long haul vehicle that goes into the U.S. has to have one of these systems installed in their truck. So, you know, it was one of those things where we were trying to solve problems um, and the timing just ended up being right for what we were doing. Right. And I think that that goes back to just starting a company in general. I think a lot of the time, you know, you think that if you build something, everybody will come. Um, But it really is just, Hey, build something, keep learning from your customers and eventually either this unique insight or the timing will match up. And that's kind of those situations where you have to take advantage of. And I think we got, um, you know, good preparation, right timing, to take advantage of that that federal mandate that came out got it and so it's it seems like you first focus on that you know that small niche of this compliance need um and this federal mandate came up and it was this great opportunity and you took hold of it and now you know you, you're at this position where you have all these trucking companies now that you sold the software to and you are now I guess the process of converting into like a marketplace where now the shippers come in and they go oh, okay so you have all these truckers on board and then are you convincing the truck trucking companies to now join this full marketplace, like link up with the shippers? Is that how it's working? Yeah. So, so very, like, yes, kind of. Um, part of the information that we get from this compliance software is, you know, real time engine information. So we actually have hardware that gets installed into each truck. So we know who's driving it, what speed they're going, where they're going. Um, and we're able to leverage that information to just get better rates, right? So let's say that you want to ship something from Vancouver to LA the best rate that you're going to get isn't from a company in Vancouver that's going to LA. It's actually from a driver in LA who's going to be in Vancouver who wants to go back home, right? So now we can actually talk to those companies and say, hey, you know, we know your driver is going to be here on this day. He wants to go back to the city he's from. Trucking company will give you a better rate and we can pass those savings on to like a shipper. So really everybody wins in the process. Um, the way we're doing it right now is, is yeah, we're, we kind of just identify those jobs for these companies and just, you know, give them a call and say, hey, is this something that, that's interesting to you? And that's kind of how we start to transition them into that, that marketplace. Okay. And so this might sound really dumb, but when you say, I'm just wrapping my head around it, but when you say shipper, am I actually imagining an actual <laughs> ship? Is that the shipper? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess <laughs> that's not even a dumb question. That, I mean, makes a lot of sense. Um, anyone who wants to move freight. Right. So it could be a manufacturer based out of, you know, Texas, for example. Um, It even could be like truly someone who's shipped something from overseas. It's hit the land and will take care of it once it hits the land. So just really the movement of freight. Oh, okay. And so these like, quote unquote, shippers, 
they don't have their own trucking teams sometimes, and then that's when they can utilize your marketplace software. I mean, mo- yeah, most most shippers don't. Um, Word. Most shippers just don't want to get into the logistics of, of trucking. I think it's it's a lot more complicated than people think. Um, whether that's because you know you have to have dispatch teams that are making sure everything's accounted for from you know when that driver picks up, when they drop off, insurance costs, fuel costs, and all of those are like fluctuating day to day. It, it's a complicated business, and I think as much as possible, you're seeing uh, even people like Amazon, right, have really started to contract out a lot of their transportation. So they will basically hire a bunch of companies in Vancouver to do like last mile deliveries, for example. And they don't really own the vehicles. They don't really hire those drivers. And so a lot of those, these trucking companies are those people that get contracted out for, you know, either larger shipments that are ongoing or like spot rates. So I just need to move something once a month. I might just call a company once a month and say, hey, I need to move this. Gotcha. And your company's based out of Vancouver, right? Yep. We're based out of Vancouver. Um, but, you know, by nature of the business, our customers are across North America. Just, you know, transportation and logistics doesn't really have boundaries per se. Um, if you're if you're a trucking company in Canada, you're probably moving things into the U.S. every single day, right? And with this federal mandate, it's every Canadian company that goes into the U.S. has to have it installed. And obviously, every company in the U.S. also has to have it installed. Got it. And so do you, it's a hardware. So do you actually go fly over to the customer's place and then install it inside the truck yourself? Or how yeah, does it so work? Yeah, so we made it super easy to use. Um, I think we always... Part of the DNA of our company is to make everything as simple as possible, right? I think especially in transportation and logistics, these guys aren't used to complicated technology, right? It was traditionally based off of paper and pen, and it still kind of is. So for us, it was we don't want people to be scared of technology. And so, you know, part of one of the design principles that that we always consider is we want to design something that sticks to the flow that they've always kind of had, so in this case, it's always simple, um, easy to use. And so our sensors right now, they can install by themselves. It takes five minutes. We have videos, we have manuals, we have support. We're kind of trying to bring that you know, new age SaaS mentality into trucking, um, but in a friendly way, because we, we just don't want people to get scared off, which it happens quite easily, right? If you think of these drivers who might've been driving a truck since high school for the last 30, 40 years, they're not used to using complicated technological systems. It's, it hasn't been a part of their job. So for the U.S. government to now say, hey, you have to do this, it's a scary thing. It's definitely a scary thing. And so we've, I think, gone out of our way just to ensure, again, easy and simple to use. So even if you ask any of our customers, I think you know the number one thing they'll tell you is they like it because it's really easy and simple. I was going to say, it, you know, <laughs> it, it somewhat seems like, you know, your your pitching has just gone so well versed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean the timing is right. <laughs> the timing is perfect. So for uh, for the listeners who are not familiar, um, so some of you may know I'm from Vancouver, and Sagar here is also from Vancouver, and we also went to the same high school, same class, yeah. Vancouver College. You're the second Vancouver College graduate. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Who's the first. Uh, the first is a previous guest called Peter Sum. Nice. Uh, okay. He was, I think, a few years ahead of us. Nice. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah. So, then, yeah. Bring, good, bringing it back to the roots. Yeah. Good, good to have more West Coast flavor in here. <laughs> and yeah, like we, I remember we connected back, back in like December and we decided, yeah, like, you know, next time you're in Toronto, let's do the podcast. And so luckily, thanks for reaching out. Later. Yeah. And yeah, you're absolutely. back in Toronto. And so we're yeah. chatting it up here. And I, I wanted to kind of take things back. Like, were, did you grow up in Vancouver? Like, were you born and raised in Vancouver? Yeah. Born and raised in Vancouver. Um, spent most of, most of my time there, literally like not yeah. that far away from our high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I think after university was really like when I just kind of started moving around a little bit, um, seeing what's out there. And I think that's, that's always super important. Yeah. Right? Otherwise you get isolated within your own environment and you're not, you know, used to, there's different industries in different places, right? Like tech in San Fran, even tech in Toronto is, is huge, a lot bigger than Vancouver. And I think those are like eye opening places to go to for sure. Oh yeah. And we, we just talked about how Vancouver is kind of a one dimensional city. It's getting more <laughs> one dimensional, I think now than even when we were growing up. Yeah. Um, and it's, so you studied engineering physics at UBC yeah. and my Don went in Waterloo. He was some kind of biochemical biomedical science major and i remember our first orientation we had, a, we had another dude who was studying physics mm-hmm. 
and he just pointed at him and said, and he said, any motherfucker studying physics is a sick ass motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> it's twisted, man. Like, I think it's weird. Part of the reason I did it was just because I was like, all right, I, I don't know exactly know what to do. And I think, man, you get forced really early on to, to make decisions about your future. And it's hard. <gasps> it's hard. And I think we've like, we've, I'm sure you've seen it as well, but people that we know that did certain, you know, fields early on, they switched, you know, three, four years in. And, you know, it, it's easy to feel bad at the time to be like, oh man, I've invested a year or two years or three years in this, but you, you don't know when you're young and you just think, oh, you know, people have said this is a great field to be in. I'm going to go do this. And people end up doing that for a long time and, and not liking it. Um, for me, again, I think early on it was, I didn't know what I wanted to do necessarily, right? I didn't know what my career was, what my job was going to be. And people are so used to just telling you the standard, you know, the standard jobs. And you think that's the only thing you're allowed to do. You go to engineering, you're only allowed to be an engineer and that's what you're going to do in the future. And there's not that many jobs out there. Um, for me, I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I wanted to do like hard things, which is a kind of twisted. I don't know why. So every time I made a decision as like what I was going to do, it was like, all right, which path is harder? I'm just going to do that because if you do hard things, then you'll learn cool stuff. And there's probably not that, you know, many people that are doing it. Therefore, there's going to be good opportunities. Wrong thinking, like completely wrong thinking made no sense at all. But I think that's why I ended up doing engineering physics in this case. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think it's actually kind of innate in, you know, I, I would position you and I kind of in this type A category. Like we've been like that in school, you know, high achieving, very yeah. driven and I think that's just naturally it. Like you're just driven to things that are harder to do. And I think earlier on, it's kind of an externally driven thing where it's everyone thinks it's hard to do, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll show them. Yeah, yeah. I'll show them. And, <laughs> and then over time, we hope to become more internally based where it's like, it's a hard thing, but I intrinsically want to do it. That's why I'm just yeah. going to do it despite it yeah. being a hard thing to do. Yeah, um, I think that happened. At some, at some point, it was just like, man, I just want to like prove to myself that, hey, I can just do this. Like I... There's nothing that, you know, shows up that I, I can't do. And I think that's kind of why I got into, you know, starting a company and starting Switchboard was just, hey, there's so many unknowns and it's cool to just figure it out. I think after a while it, it became less about like it's hard and more of like, oh, I just want to figure this out and I think I can do it. Yeah. And so, you know, throughout your university career, you had some great internships. You worked at BlackBerry, you were at Intel, you were at Apple. Like These are, you know... It, from from a biz, business perspective, like I'm yeah. thinking like, yeah, you, you hit the jackpot there. Like in, when I was in accounting, <laughs> everyone wants to work, work at the big four, the big yeah. consulting firms, you know, like the big investment funds. Like you you hit that as like an engineer, right? You did yeah. BlackBerry, Intel, Apple. These are great titans. And so, but despite that, you went into entrepreneurship. And so before we touch upon that, something I, I was more curious on uh, is when you were in BlackBerry and Intel, you were a hardware engineer. And then when you're in Apple, you were a software engineer. I can I understand that there's a difference between hardware and software. Yeah. One one soft yeah, one soft, one's hard. But in terms of the work you actually do, yeah. what's the difference? I, is it isn't it just all coding? Yes. <laughs> I mean <laughs> it's funny because even like I mean when I started engineering, it's not like I knew the difference either. Like I was like, okay, cool, hardware, software, I don't really know what that means. Like you just like read a Wikipedia description and like you pretend like you understand what it is, but you still don't really until you start doing it. <laughs> So at BlackBerry, I was like a firmware engineer, dealt with a little bit of hardware. And then I knew that I didn't really want to do that. So I started doing hardware at Intel, didn't knew I didn't really want to do that. So I started doing software at Apple. But so the difference is like software, yes. Like, you know, you think of sitting in front of a computer, coding. Um, firmware is usually really low level stuff. So you're dealing with like bits and bytes and like program, you're still programming, but you're programming like microprocessors that aren't really that complicated and you can't run like crazy complex code on them so if you're just just trying to lay it back to the business layman here is so my extent of knowledge of like the coding world is like you have you know when i think of software it's like front end back end back end guys tend to yeah. you know quote unquote be a little more intense they have more you have to like python you have to do more of like the actual architecture of the full kind of data processing and everything whereas yeah. front end is kind of more making sure it actually works when I click something yeah. and it connects to the back end. Yeah. And so if you're talking about firm firmware engineering, like is that kind of like when you say it's um, kind of lower level, is it kind of more like QA? So it's more like it's more like 
here's this black chip. If I apply a battery to this, it turns on. And if it turns on, what's like the next step that this black box should do? So we're talking like oh, so literally steps. plugging a chip into like a big controller. And you're just saying like, if this voltage is on, then do this. So it's not even like, I can't even run front end, back end. Any, it's a, like all of that stuff is built on these little chips that have firmware on them. Oh. So it's kind of like, how do I explain this? It's almost like, like one chip, for example, that you can buy. It's called like an AND chip. So if you have a battery applied to the left side and the right side, that chip will just tell you this is true because they're both on and on. And if one's off and the other's on, then it'll equal false, right? So like that's literally like the most basic fundamental level of chipsets that, that you can get. So that's like firmware level programming. So it's not even like... It's a true false programming. Yeah, per, like pretty much. It's, it's built off of like bits and bytes. Uh -huh. So very low level stuff. And then front end, back end is like, you know, you can do complicated things and run complicated commands that other people have really just built underneath you and you keep utilizing and, and being able to do bigger things. Um, hardware engineering is more like, now I'm going to design, like, you know, the motherboards that you have in like your computer, you're like designing those. So you're saying like, if I put a chip here, this is like the voltage and this is what it's going to have to do here just so people can actually run code on them, right? So you're not even touching code at the hardware level. Got it. Yeah. And so you didn't like that part? No, I, I, I didn't like any of that. And not, not because it wasn't fun. Um, I did enjoy it all. Like I, I enjoyed everything. I just realized that I didn't want to work 40 hours a week for somebody else's vision. And I think that was that was the base of it all. Um, like I can do all those things, you know, it's fun, um, but it's again for somebody else, right? Like when you're working at Apple, BlackBerry, Intel, you're creating a product that the company wants, right? And you might like the product, you might think it's cool, um, but again, you're at the end of the day contributing to the company's bottom line. And if if I'm gonna spend that sort of time, especially early in my career, working on something. I just want to do it for something that I'm really, really passionate about. That's going to drive what my vision is at the end of the day. Right. So I think that's why I decided, Hey, these weren't necessarily the places where I wanted to work. Was, was there a particular point or moment where it just became very clear to you that that's not what you want to do? Um, I don't think there was any particular moment. I think it was probably over the course of, you know, a couple months. I think after every internship, you just learn a little bit more, which is why I, I always tell people like, hey, internships are super important. At least you get to like get your hands dirty and figure out like if this is what you want to do for the rest of your life. And I think every single time, that's why I, I did something different. So after BlackBerry, that's why I went into like hardware. And then when I went into software with Apple, I, was, I just think I just realized that the last thing didn't satisfy my need. And after Apple, I you know, thought I actually wanted to go back to school. Um, I thought I wanted to get into financial engineering. That was what I was getting ready for, you know, writing the GRE and everything, um, getting my applications ready. And then I think the day that I was supposed to submit my application, um, I was applying to Berkeley at the time. And I just, I, I deleted the application. I didn't even send it in. So I did the GRE. I prepared my application. Everything was filled out. And then I just decided that I wanted to, try my hand at starting something instead. And uh, that was when I applied to the next 36. So it was like a program here in Toronto where they help help entrepreneurs pretty much, or they choose like 36 entrepreneurs and they kind of expedite them and teach them the basics of starting a business. And so that's when I applied there instead. And the rest is kind of like history. Wow. And so what was this happening concurrently? Like what did you, were you cognizantly aware of two you know, contrasting options of one going to Berkeley and one in next 36, then you just decided let's just apply to both at the same time? Or was it more linear in terms of, um, or step-by-step -step where y you were focused on this whole Berkeley thing? Yeah. And I'm sure the application process is another kind of tedious one where you study for the GRE, get a get reference letter, just kind of commit to it, write an essay or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly what it was. Okay. And I, so I did both at the same time. Um, and so I, I kind of knew next 36 was there while I was doing, you know, applying to Berkeley. But then I, after a while, I was like, even if I got into like financial engineering and, you know, did the whole Wall Street thing, I just didn't think that that was going to be what I wanted to do anyway. So that's why I was like, okay, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm just not going to do this. Um, 
And I think it was the right decision. <laughs> like, I mean, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. But uh, I, I had always kind of wanted to do my own startup. Um, I had like new venture design. It was like a course at UBC where you partner up with, um, you know, some business majors, some other engineers, and you guys try to start start a company. So I had done that. Um, I had worked with some of my friends earlier on in university to like try our hands at some interesting projects. Um, like we had our capstone project, for example, and the one that we picked was something that we thought we could commercialize. And so it was always kind of in the back of my mind, always something I wanted to try. And so, you know, I think part of the reason why, you know, we officially took the jump was when you're young, it's easier to take risks, right? I think at the end of the day, if, if everything went to shit, I'm pretty sure my parents would take me back in their basement, right? And it's like, what, what's the worst case that could really happen? And I think as you get older, there's just more and more things that you have to worry about. And it's, it's harder to take that jump as time goes on. I think, and I totally agree with you. I think that's a very uh, pragmatic way of looking at things. Though, I think as, I'm obviously biased, but from my experience in school and also just with friends and having been in the finance world, not necessarily Wall Street, but Bay Street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wall Street. Yeah. It, I think especially for type A people or people who've done, you know, gone to these big brands, like you you have Apple and Intel and BlackBerry. And I think there's that fear of, you know, losing out on something that, you know, you could, I feel like that most people, most engineers would say, as an internship at Apple, I should go full time. It's it's a great gig. It's a great brand. And although the pragmatic thing is like, I've done it once, I can probably do it again. Yeah. I feel like it's really hard for people to get over that. And I'm curious, what what was your process? Like, did you, did you wrestle with those kinds of emotions? Yeah, I think there's always like that opportunity cost, right? If I'm going to do this and then this opportunity, other people are doing this opportunity, I could have done this. Um, this might slip away. I might not be able to do it again. And I think as long as you're doing something where you're learning and you're going to come out of it having you know, now a better person than you were before, then I think the opportunities will only increase, right? Like logically, I mean, if you're able to do it before, you should be able to do it again. And now if you know more information today than you did four months ago, then, you know, to me, the way I look at it is you're only in a better position, not a worse position. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And I think if you're scrappy and if you're always willing to adapt to the environment around you, you'll always find an opportunity somewhere. Um, and that was kind of the way I looked at it. Got it. And are are your parents entrepreneurs? Were this did they, and so if they were, were they like supportive of this? Like I guess because like they're entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah. So they're not entrepreneurs. Um, I would say they're like entrepreneurial. Hmm. Um, just because I think like being an entrepreneur isn't the only way to to be an entrepreneur in that sense. Uh, but obviously, they were always like at, I think especially at the beginning it was a big project based thing for so like, Oh, how's your project going? Um, you know, how are things like what's next? So I think for them, it was always, Hey, I'm trying my hand at something. And they always thought that I would just come back to a job. I think over time they just started realizing that, Hey, this thing just kept going and kept going and kept going. And at some point they were like, Oh, like, are, are you going to get a job or like, what's going on here? I was like, oh, this is kind of going well, and I'm just going to kind of stick with it and, and see this through. So it was like a very gradual thing. And I think in the back of their mind, they, they did think I would come back to a job, and I just never did. <laughs> <laughs> and what, why, why Wall Street? Like, why financial engineering? I had no idea that you wanted to go to Wall Street. Like, was, yeah. was it going, was, when you say financial engineering, is it, you know, joining a quant fund, and you're going to dedicate your life to making, like, two basis points and making a trade? A tenth of a millisecond faster. Yeah, pretty much. Oh yeah. <laughs> like I think I, I, even my last project at UBC, it was really just like coming up with my own algorithmic trading. Um, so I spent like a ton of time like starting to look into that. I just thought it was like super interesting, and I thought the the most interesting part of that was how human bias kind of factors into a lot of a lot of decision making and kind of seeing what the general um, like seeing if you could kind of quantify people's feelings on like Twitter, for example towards 
you know, different stocks and seeing how that impacted. And I think it was kind of Tesla at the time that was super volatile. And it was always dependent on like how people were looking at the stock and what they thought of Elon Musk. And I was trying to figure out if I could like quantify that and like take advantage of those situations. And that was just like, oh, cool. Okay. I love trading. Like this is kind of what I want to do. And then, yeah, that, that, that was the end of, end of that, though. <laughs> you quickly realized that I, my life could probably spent doing better things. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just like my life could be spent doing many things, right? I think that's part of entrepreneurship is you never get bored because there's so much to do. And you can, you know, do try your hand at legal. You can try your hand at recruiting, engineering, like all sorts of different things because there's, there's never... There's never enough time to figure out everything, right? So it's always interesting. It's always dynamic, and every day is like different than it was the day before. Mm-hmm. And so you've been operating Switchboard for four years, close to four years now, I think. And yeah, yeah it's, it's been wild. Yeah. And so when you first joined Next Thirty Six, so you said it's the program that kind of brings people together and that kind of helps you out in the early stages. Is it does it include kind of idea generation and all that? Like, is that where Switchboard came from, or did you already have the idea of helping truckers? in mind yeah so i think that that idea was always in the back of my mind um next 36 is more i think it was less about like hey let's help you start a great company and more about let's prepare you so that even if you don't start a company today you'll start something in like five years or 10 years or you'll always be kind of entrepreneurial in what you do so very focused on the individuals Um, i think i was super lucky to be put in a team with somebody i had known already previously in university. Um, so we knew we worked well together. And I think we tried our hands at a couple different ideas. Um, and then they were just, they were no, like they were bad ideas. They were, they were very bad ideas. I, you could talk to anybody in the next 36 probably. And they'll just be like, Oh man, I'm so glad you guys switched from like the first couple things that you did. <laughs> tell me what, tell me one bad oh, idea. Man. It was, uh, there was like, a, so our original company was called like Coral. A coral? Coral, like C-O-R-A-L. Oh. And it was pretty much like Amazon after Amazon was there. But like we tried to say there was like a unique twist to it and you could create like a boutique website. Um, it just wasn't that great. And we like I think the problem there was we didn't know anything about e-commerce. So, And you see that a lot, I think, in startups and entrepreneurship where people are trying to solve problems that they know nothing about. Um, which can be good or bad, good in the sense that you're not biased by existing ideas in that space, but bad because you don't know enough about that space to know um, how that idea fits into the larger picture, right? I I don't think you can always just say, oh, this is the idea and and it makes sense to me and now I'm going to enforce this on everybody. I think you need to actually really understand how people interact in that space as it is and if what you're solving is even a problem or not. Um, so in that e-commerce space, we just didn't know anything. Um, and I don't think we had the passion to figure it out. So we had this other idea that was, you know, pestering in the back of our minds. Um, and that was because we had family in the space, right? So we had family that were in trucking, um, they were shippers, they were truck drivers, and it was just problems that we had heard existed before. And then when we finally decided to switch to it, um, that was an interesting story actually, So next 36, four months long. And most people, you know, they pick their idea, they work on it for four months, and then they have demo day at the very end. Well, it sounds like university, we have to pick what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And then you have (laughs) to go on with it. Pretty pretty much. And then you have to, in this case, it's like your thesis, like you're presenting at the very last day being like, this is, you know, what we're doing. Invest in us is a great idea. Um, And so three months into the program, we were still working on Coral. And you know, we all sat in a room and we were like, this is a bad idea. We we know it is. We know we're going to switch. Uh, but demo day is coming up. Like we get, we can't just show up there and not present something like it looks really bad. Um, and then we were like, okay, well, why would we waste a month of our lives? Like it, it doesn't make sense just to impress some people in a room and like not embarrass ourselves. I think for us, it was if we truly want to start a company, like if, if that's really what we want to do, then we should stop worrying about the short term. Like we're not in it for that. And so we sat in the room and we said, all right, we're switching ideas. And now we have three weeks to get some stuff together. So at least we don't like embarrass ourselves. But if we want to continue after the program, then let's just switch now and not waste three weeks or four weeks doing it. And so that's that's when we actually switched to what we're doing now, 
which is, you know, kind of the freight marketplace stuff. It was three weeks before demo day and we were like, screw it, let's do it, let's switch it and let's go. And so that was kind of the story of how it all started. Oh, wow. And and so you talked about how you had family in the space that were in like trucking and freight. And so yeah. that kind of gave you the premise of we know this problem exists yeah. and it made, I guess, it really hit home in terms of, you know, you have family involved. Yeah, 100%. So it wasn't like one of those things where we were like, oh, if we can just like, fix this problem in an industry where we don't even know if it is a problem. It was just, we knew it was a problem. Like a hundred percent, we knew it was a problem because we had heard it so many times. And I think we were just very well positioned at the time to start trying to address and find a solution to that. Right. So it wasn't like we had a solution and now we were finding the problem. We, we knew what the problem was and the rest of our time was finding out how to solve it. Right. And I think, you see a lot of people that come up with the solution and then try to look around to see what problem they can solve with it. Um, and I mean, you hear that all the time and, and you always hear like, hey, it's not the best way to do it, but it always happens over and over and over again. So in our case, just we knew the problem and we just spent the last couple of years just finding out the best way to solve it. Right. And you said how first you niched in into the compliance side for truckers. And yeah. then as the ball got rolling, you incorporate incorporated the shippers and the freight and all that and so how did you narrow in on the compliance yeah like and and that wasn't easy right it, so so we knew the problem we didn't know the solution and so we kept trying to find solutions to the problem and we at the beginning like we pivoted two times i think before compliance so, so can you take had, me through like the steps of like even if if you can even give me like the time duration of how long it took for each pivot and all oh that yeah too, that'd be great so when we started um, that three weeks beforehand, we spent a couple of weeks just trying to figure out how we wanted to do it. And then we thought, hey, we should have like a, a full service dispatch solution that's, you know, SaaS based, um, uses your mobile device so that somebody in the office can now dispatch jobs to their driver on their phone. Um, it tracks when they pick up, drop off. They just interact with this app. And we spent probably, I think, a year building that. So it was a great dispatch solution. Um, very full featured, but the problem was the sales cycle was really long, right? The sales cycle for some, you to go to somebody and say, I need you to run your whole trucking operation on this software takes a while. You can't just walk in, sell it, and then move on to the next company. So we just weren't growing as fast as we needed to on the trucking side, right? Like I think we could have built a good business over time, but for us to hit the marketplace, we needed a lot of trucks on board and that was not getting us a lot of trucks. Oh, so you had a vision to have a marketplace ahead of time. So yes. that was like the long-term vision. It was just, how do we get there? Exactly. So marketplace was day one. Day one, we wanted to connect shippers with truck drivers. And so the whole time we were just thinking, how do we get a lot of trucking companies on board so that we can solve this half of the equation, right? So that dispatch software, long sales cycle, too, too intense. It was way too intense. Um, and so after a while, we were like, okay, we need to focus on something that a lot of companies can use very easily without us having to walk into their office, you know, have six meetings, show them the software, slowly migrate their data over. It just didn't make sense. And so after a year, we pivoted to just document handling. So all it was was that drivers could take pictures of their documents. It would fit into their trucking flows. And so they could send the paperwork back to the office so they could invoice their customer right away as opposed to waiting two weeks for the driver to come back, hand in the papers, and then invoicing, because you always need you know the paper and the signature there. So that was what we did second, um, and and that did that did okay. It did a little bit better. You know, we got a little bit more trucks on board, but not necessarily again at the speed that we needed them to get on board. Um, and so we knew that this compliance issue was you know something that was going to come up. Um, we worked on the document stuff for like four months. So four months, we you know got some customers. We tried some cool things like fax ads, which, you know, we, we tried to dial it back for the industry because we knew they still faxed a lot. So we used to send out fax ads, which was like, when we would tell people, they were like so mind blown. They were like, faxing is still a thing. And we're like, yeah, man, in trucking, like everybody faxes. Like these guys still go to like truck stops and pay a dollar to like fax a page to the office sometimes. So it's crazy. Everybody's got a fax machine. Um, but document dispatch, that was the end of that because we heard that compliance was coming in. Um, we had some pretty like good information that they were going to mandate it. And so we started to get pretty much moving on that because we knew it was going to be a big opportunity for us. And we were in a very good position because we had been dealing with so many trucking companies. Um, we started to really understand how these trucking companies think, 
right? So even when we made dispatch early on, I wouldn't say we really knew the industry. We really didn't know our customers that well. But by this time, we had spent so much time with these companies, spent so much time with these drivers that we had a very different perspective. So if this, if the compliance thing was what we did on day one, I don't think it would have been successful. Um, I don't think we had the knowledge that we needed to make it successful. So that's why I say like the timing was really good and, and the amount of time we spent in the industry was really good because we had kind of developed those connections and developed that true understanding of how it fits into the larger picture. Um, and so we started, or the compliance software, we started to build probably at the end of 2016. So it was, we were like a year and a half in at that point. Um, we had stayed really lean, obviously, so we could still be around and still have the team there. Um, and that was, yeah, the rest was kind of history from there. Oh, wow. So even even then, like a, a year and a half of trying to make things work, constantly testing. And even, I feel like even to get these kind of old, like you said, kind of old industry, people who still fax, who still you know don't want to adopt new technology and kind of coming in as these young kids saying, hey, man, do you want to use this? dispatch system yeah we haven't tried it yet yeah. do you want to be the first one like how, yeah. how was how was the first pitch <laughs> it was it was rough it was uh I, I don't i don't even think we knew how to pitch um but we also had very good advice from people around us so i think it like i think we got to skip a lot of those like early mistakes i mean we still made a ton of mistakes but that's why it's like useful to have people in your network that did startups themselves have gone through the process because, you know, they would just kind of give you tips and stuff here and there. So early on, what we did was we would just go to companies and say, hey, we want to build the software. Um, why don't you give us advice on like what you would like to see? And I think the idea there was get advice from somebody so that they feel invested in your product and they're more likely to use it when you actually start to release it or when you're doing beta testing. Right. So we would actually sit in their offices for hours just monitoring what they did their day to day, building that relationship showing them pieces, asking them for advice. And so they actually felt invested in the product itself. Oh, well, so you, I guess you kind of got your friend the door by just approaching them and saying, this is what we want to build. Can we just chat and get thoughts from you, advice from you? Exactly, because um, I think if, if you look at like a lot of the larger transportation companies, they've built in-house software, right? And they've spent a ton of money doing it. It's, ex it's an expensive endeavor. Or you hire out one of these bigger companies who are going to charge you an arm and a leg to like customize it to your need. So if you go to a small to medium sized enterprise and you're like, hey, I want to build software for you and you can help like mold it to them. They're like, oh, wow, this is a great opportunity. Like nowhere else or no other time would they be able to have software that kind of fits their flow. And it, it's pretty custom. It's brand new um, for free, essentially. Right. Because they're we're taking their early feedback and actually building a product. And I think that was like one of the, the big learnings that we just kept seeing over time was just make sure that we involve the customers as early as possible. Um, and that might mean that that first customer is not going to really pay that much for it because, you know, they sacrifice their time to help you build that product. Um, that's always, always super important. Mm. And, you know, so you're, you're on this entrepreneurial journey, you forwent the wall street life, which, you know, it, I can obviously assume that the pay is amazing there <laughs> so you yeah, yeah. you chose the lean startup life how how is it like just the the battle with the financial you know inflows slash i guess more so outflows yeah. with, i mean you're you're doing it right now right? yeah so you're, let, you're let's, gone from financial world to uh start like doing an entrepreneurial thing yourself now so i, I mean how, how does it feel for you oh it's, it's tough i think so i i tell people that it kind of comes in weird three months Three month blocks where the first three months you kind of go oof i can eh, it's, it's okay and then slowly afterwards like there's this gap where six months six months in nine months in then then i'm like really feeling it and yeah. getting slowly paranoid and worried and i think now so i've just gone past 13 months of not having wow that's uh, a long time uh, yeah salary that's a long and time. So, yeah it's it's weird it's i'm getting i'm I'm getting more comfortable though. I've recently just started kind of feeling comfortable with it. And um, it, it's like I was on a drug for a very long time. And I'm the going, drug of drug of a paycheck of a paycheck. Yeah. yeah. This it's this constant drip. It's like an IV drip, drip, yeah. drip, 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 drip every two weeks. And then now like I'm just kind of going through like, like rehab 
<laughs> relearning. Yeah, yeah and kind of learning how to live. Yeah, because well, it's it's weird because we spent the first what twenty. 22 23 years of our lives not having a paycheck like we like you know i'd work part-time jobs and stuff or yeah. do taing in university and so yeah you get that but we're internships but that's not even getting like a whole years worth of drip 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 yeah and then i just have this drug for about four years and then i go hmm i can't live without it yeah, and then <laughs> yeah and it takes about a year to just kind of wean off of it and be like i think i'm still okay yeah how was it like for you i think it was and so I think it was easier for me than that only because I never built my lifestyle on having that paycheck, right? I think after university, I still acted like a university student. I never, um, you know, had that drip, drip, drip. So I, I never built my lifestyle around that. And I think it was easier for me to just continue living the way I did and, and just kind of keep moving forward like that. So it's really just been like a, a lifestyle decision, I think, where you just, you were never under that, um, kind of blank check mentality. And so I just, I don't know. I never, I I think you, you start to think about it though, the older you get, right. It's like, oh man, savings, for example, like, how are you going to, you know, where, where are you going to get those from, for example? Um, but that just comes with more of a drive to build a sustainable business. Right. Mm. And I think it's, it's a nice kick in the ass too, to say like, Hey, if I really want to do this, I shouldn't be doing it anyways if it's like losing money, for example, right? And I'm not going to do this for 20 years if it's losing money because that just means that something's fundamentally wrong with the business. So I think it's like more drive to just figure out making sure the unit economics makes sense, making sure that you're able to build a sustainable company um, so that you can have those things in life later. Um, and I don't think we ever did it for the money anyways. I think we always did it for the experiences. So like, I think we've we've been able to, get whatever we needed and, and accomplish like in terms of experiences. I think it's always about experiences for me, um, not necessarily like the goods involved. And I think we've probably had some crazy experiences that we never otherwise would have had that no amount of money would have been able to buy. And that's like, those are really the things for us where we're going to look back and be like, that was awesome. Like that was, that was a cool time in, in our lives. Yeah. 100%. I think I'm, I'm getting more accustomed to that kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, it's 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 definitely one thing where I've grown up constantly reading reading about it. Like you see my bookshelf, I've read a lot. Yeah. But I think when you're living it, it's it's different. Um, and so f you talked about these extreme experiences. So can you go go through share like a couple where you know you you told me about how a lot of there's ups and downs. There's constant ups and downs. Yeah. Like shit gets fucked, and I feel you would go through bigger volatility than someone like me who's just running a single person entity, whereas you have a full company with other employees and everything. So what what kind of moments kind of stick out for you as, well, oh, we, you know, I didn't know we'd survive through this. Yeah, man, there is, there's definitely times. I think uh, when we made that, that last pivot into compliance was a big one. Um, I think going into hardware and like making sure that, hey, you can, finance a, a ton of hardware as a, as a young startup that's an interesting challenge um to you know tie up tons and tons of money in, in hardware that you believe that you'll be able to sell i think that's a big big jump in itself i think that was super stressful um you know even like raising investment for the first time and then spending that money and, and you're almost like wow I've, I've never had you know this much money and it's not my money you, you treat it like someone else's money um and so that was an experience just to be able to get a hold of that and say, Hey, at the end of the day, somebody believed in us to build our, our company and our vision. And I should be comfortable, like, you know, spending that money. Um, obviously in a lean sense, not like, Oh, I'm going to splurge and like, you know, buy a million, a million, million dollar in ads or something like that. Um, but just like having the confidence to do that. And then the inventory thing was a big one. I remember men during our, our like big kind of growth bump. I don't think me and my co-founder slept more than like three hours a night for like a month. It was just like crazy. And it's like those experiences where, you know, we'd just wake up and we'd be packing boxes, literally like ship out the door. And we would just be doing that for like three weeks. Cause you know, we just, you didn't have time to hire someone at that point. It was almost like, no, we got to do this and we got to will this into existence. Um, those type of experiences, which I don't think you would have had no matter where you were. Right. It's just like raw experiences that were literally just you trying to will this company into existence. 
when you say packing balls, like you're actually packing your hardware. Into- yeah, packing our hardware and just shipping it out the door. Like it oh. was, yeah, <laughs> out of out of like our startup house. So we were literally just every morning we'd wake up and make sure that we could just pack as many boxes as we can, provision enough devices, um, stack boxes and boxes and boxes by the door so that FedEx would come and like pick everything up and ship it out. Um, you know, had to have that done by like 9 a.m., for example, every morning so we wouldn't miss our shipment um, and we could get the device in like our customer's hands as fast as possible. Wow. And th- the first time you actually got financing, was that because you ha- had to make the pivot into hardware? Uh, no, actually, we, we got it uh, before that because um, I think we just found people that really believed in our vision, um, really believed in the team. So I know we were talking earlier about how, you know, in Canada, you find that it's more people are, are looking at the unit economics, the actual product market fit. I think we had some really early stage investors that just believed in us as people. Um, and really believe that, you know, we were going to do some cool stuff in the industry. And so we, we just kind of stayed as lean as we could and, and tried to work off of that and find interesting ways to like, you know, finance inventory. Um, and, you know, we, we came up with unique solutions, obviously, at, at the time, because I think when you're in those situations, and that's part of entrepreneurship, you'll just find ways to kind of get it done. Is, is there, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of different uh, events, but is there one particularly memorable one that you kind of cling to as like, this was like the inflection point of, yeah, after this, we knew, you knew that, you know, you could continue doing this for an indefinite period or like, you know, yeah. a decade to come. I mean, I, I think that, I don't know if there was like a day. I think it was probably like a month. Mm-hmm. I think it was probably like October of 2017 or November of 2017. Um, and that was just, so the, the federal mandate came into play on December 17th of 2017. Um, and so a lot of in, in trucking transportation, I think it comes down to, it, it's hard to plan ahead a lot of the time. So a lot of the companies that, you know, we were dealing with, they wanted to make decisions at, at the last possible moment. So as much as, you know, as much time we spent in sales, we didn't see the fruits of the labor, labor right away. And we didn't see them till like almost the end of the year. So we were like in the back of our heads, we were like, oh man, like what's going on here? Like, you know, this inventory is not really moving. And then all of a sudden November of that year hits and like everything just starts moving. And we're like, wow, this is crazy. Like as much as we planned for this, we don't think we could have planned for this. Um, We just weren't ready for that. And I think that was like when we finally realized that, hey, things are actually, things are actually happening here. Um, And that, you know, the business is going to start growing after that. So it it was cool. It was a cool experience for sure. And so how, how long was that sales period where you'd be knocking on doors, kind of getting all these sales and the, the length of time until it stopped moving? So when did you start trying to get all these sales? Like, so the end is November when yeah. it's all moving, but how, how earlier did you start? Probably like six months before that. Wow, that's a we, long time. We started, yeah, we started to talk to companies and we were like, hey, this is happening at the end of the year. Plan ahead for this. Um, you know, you're going to need to be ready. And every company's like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. No, for sure. Send me more information. Like, learn about this. So we just spent like pretty much those six months building relationships with companies um, and always trying to convince them to buy early, buy early, buy early. And like nobody was really buying early. And we're like, what's going on here? Like, why are they not buying early? Um, and it's just because one, they didn't think the mandate was going to stick. They didn't think that, um, you know, they thought Trump was actually going to reverse it at the time. Um, so everybody just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And so, you know, after a while, like three months, you're like, damn, like nobody's buying here. Like what's going on? Um and they were just waiting. And then once someone stopped waiting, that was kind of when everybody stopped waiting, which which was like unfortunate because, you know, you, you're you having this huge influx and you're trying to like find enough time in the day to make sure that you can, you know, satisfy everything. Um, so that was that was like the wildest month for sure by yeah. far. And, you know, since then you've, you know, you got accepted into Y Combinator. And so congrats for completing those, was it four months? Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, it was four uh, january february march so about three months okay three months yeah yeah so why why did you apply to y combinator what was the intention behind that so the intention behind that um i think it was we we were ready to launch the second phase of our business um and you know we had been around for like two three years at that point or three years i guess three and a half um and that, that second phase of business was really like launching a new company all over again. Um, you know, we're, we're now reaching out to shippers. We're doing that second half of the market. And I think we're going to go through, you know, a lot of the same 
building processes that we did when we were building compliance software for trucking companies. And so it's kind of a nice, you know, kick in the ass, surrounding yourself with very smart people that have built marketplaces that are building marketplaces, other very smart founders. And I think it, as much as, you know, you think that you're, you're self-motivated and, and as much as you are self-motivated, it's a much different environment when there's people around you that are also self-motivated. And now you're, you're seeing other people around you doing really well, doing really cool things, um, trying creative strategies, being very aggressive, pushing hard, um, and it pushes you to move even faster. And I think for us, it's all about speed right now. It's We want to be able to move fast. We want to be able to make an impact right away. And we do want to grow the company. And just being in that environment kind of helped instill that even more and made us move a little bit faster for sure. And, you know, again, we talk about it and we're like, oh man, why were we moving this fast like last week when we weren't in YC? Um, and it's just like, I think you just come to the realization that there's always ways to move faster, right? As much as you think you're moving really fast until you see like what the relative speed is, especially in San Francisco, which is, you know, the heart of technology. That's when you really like understand the scope of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, ha I had a previous guest who actually went through Y Combinator as well. And he was telling me how when he went to San Fran, it was four dudes in like a one bedroom apartment <laughs> or a studio apartment. They just all bought air mattresses and they're just jokes. coding nonstop and just eating pizza and never going out. Yeah. What was your experience? Like? What, was, what was the, what was the, um, I'm sure you had expectations. Yeah. And so what was the reality of it? What are the differences? Yeah. I think, uh, like, I mean, he, he's pretty spot on. There was, I think four of us, you know, and, uh, we had a two bedroom in this Ooh. case. Yeah. So it was two and two in each, in, in each room. All right. Cause you had um, uh, two years of operations and you're starting making money. <laughs> yeah. I, we got a good deal because the guy that we rented our place from was an ex founder himself. So we, we got a good deal. Uh, but it was also the office, so that was where everything went down. And, uh, man, there was 40 chicken McNuggets for $10 in the U.S., and, like, that was sustenance. <laughs> like, you, you can't even get that good of a deal here. It's ridiculous. But you know the chicken eggs are smaller. Yeah, but 40 of them for $10? I, know, like, I, I think at some point it's just no matter the size of the Canadian nuggets, I, I don't think for $10 you're getting the same amount of food. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to L.A., um, it was it was like the the Vancouver College band trip oh, in Disneyland. Yeah, yeah. We got, or actually no, we might I might have just gone down separately with the other VC guys, yeah. and we got a hundred chicken nuggets for twenty dollars, and we're oh just God. carrying the whole thing through the subway, <laughs> and everyone's just staring at us. Man, this is like chicken McNuggets at McDonald's are so good too. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you see this, these like four like Asian looking sixteen year olds with bags of chicken, chicken nuggets. nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we threw like. We threw like a little party at our place like a couple times. Like every time we did that, we just ordered a bunch of chicken McNuggets. <laughs> and every it was like the happiest thing for everybody. Like they just see chicken McNuggets and like, oh my God, this is great. Like, yeah. You know, at the end of a night, just having some greasy chicken McNuggets <laughs> at the spot. Exactly. And so then what, what, what are you doing uh, when you're there for three months? What, what, is your, what are your weeks look like? Yeah. So at YC, what you do is um, once a week, you have like a group dinner. And so you go up to the group, you show up to group dinners, you have group office hours. So they'll kind of divide you into different cohorts of companies that are similar, um, not necessarily like the same business, but maybe going through the same challenges, launching a marketplace, um, doing logistics, that sort of stuff. And you'll honestly you just sit in a room once a week and, you know, your group partners will kind of spur a discussion. It might be like, hey, what's your biggest problem right now? Um, and, you know, some of them will even ask at the beginning, what, how much have you grown like since last week? Um, what are you trying right now? And I think that just forces people to actually think of their real problems. And so you'll talk about it and other people in the room will propose solutions. Um, your group partners will help you talk about it, maybe come up with solutions as well, or even validate what you're doing. Um, and that it's only like, you know, two hours every Thursday, just that part of it. And I think that's enough for people to one realize that other people are doing you know good things week over week and it, it wants you it makes you want to do good things week over week make a new sale um get some more feedback whatever it is and then hopefully you come back the next week with a different problem right so that you're always making progress and it's not the same problem every single week because that just shows you and, and everybody else that hey maybe the problem lies somewhere else here um so it kind of forces you just to every week make progress make progress make progress um, they bring in, they bring in very good founders to also come talk to everybody. 
right? So we had the founders of Cruise Automation. We had um, the founders of Reddit come in, Airbnb, just to be very candid with you and say, hey, this is this is what it's like to run a company. Um, these are the things that you know you guys should look out for, and it's an opportunity for you to ask them questions as well. And I think you get a ton of value out of that because you can see kind of point A where you are today and then you know point B, C, D where these companies are today, and, and they've gone through a similar process. Um, that's pretty much what YC is really like. It's just an opportunity for like-minded people to come together and, and have good discussions that will hopefully help you solve problems in your own business. Was was there a particular learn? What particular learning uh, kind of resonated with you that kind of stuck with you? I don't know if there was a particular learning. I think it was more um, like what what we really got out of YC was again just being around those people um i guess if you do want to d- bring out to that particular learning that probably goes back to what i said before which is just make sure that you're always solving the problems that are holding your business back and that you know you're able to come up with a strategy deploy it and actually improve week over week um, whether that means that now you've identified another sub problem that's that's holding you back like for example Hey, maybe the problem is you're not getting a lot of leads in your funnel. Okay, why are you not? Um, hey, maybe you got to make more phone calls. So you try to make 100 phone calls. Next week you come back and maybe the problem is, hey, we made 100 phone calls, but then we realize that a lot of these guys aren't really our customers or you know they're not the type of people that would actually buy our product. Okay, what's the problem? You're calling the wrong type of customer. Okay, hey, let's figure out who the right type is and now make 100 co- phone calls for that person, right? So it's just always iterating and making sure that you're actually trying to solve the problem, right? And you're not just like spraying and praying and you're actually doing this in an intelligent way. Um, I think that was a big learning. Um, what else? Probably, I mean, obviously use the people around you. There's there's very smart people that have been there that have done that um, and they give you an opportunity to, to connect with those people. So, you know, pick their brains, ask them questions, um, try to, you know, almost growth hack your problems in the sense of like, hey, why why go through that same problem that everybody else has? Maybe if you had a discussion with somebody, you wouldn't have to you know, have that exact same problem. Um, and then they just surround you with a good community so that you can actually, again, foster those conversations and have those discussions. Hmm. And when, when you go through YC, I think there's this kind of expectation that you're going to be a unicorn. Hmm. Yeah. You know, they, it's common to talk about, are you growing a thousand percent every week, every yeah. month, that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you have that pressure now? Do you feel it of, and do you have that desire to become that unicorn? I mean, I, I don't think for us personally, it doesn't come down to, do we want to be that unicorn? I think it comes down to like, Hey, are we making the impact that we need in the industry as fast as we, as fast as we can? And if the result of that is a unicorn, um, then great. Right. I don't think for us, it's like, Oh, this is, <clears throat> this is a goal and we need to find a way to hit it. Um, our goal is, is, I think, very business specific. And if we're hitting our very business specific goals, then we're making the impact that we sought out to do from the beginning. And that that's what drives us as a business. Yeah, that makes sense. And so then as we kind of hit upon this last leg of our interview, I wanted to ask, uh, it's a question that I ask a lot of my guests. And it's if the 20 year old Sager, we'll see, look at what you're doing right now. Mm-hmm. So then I guess that you're in like third year. You yeah. could have probably done your stints at BlackBerry and Intel. Maybe it's just before you did Apple. Yep. Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What, and you saw what you're doing right now. What do you think that emotional reaction is, would be from that Sagar? I think you'd be pretty stoked. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be like, yeah, that's awesome. Like that's kind of like, I think the path that, that he wanted to be on. Um, and I think the, I think it's hard to get past like the very early stage of, of having an idea and then like actually making that first sale. Like I think that's that's a really hard process. And I think at that time I was like very much in like the idea phase and trying to come up with like ideas. So I think he, he'd look at it in like a pretty cool way. He'd be like, all right, cool. Like if that's at least the, the bare minimum of where I think I'll be, then like everything will be kind of okay. Yeah. Um, and, and at least like I'm on a path. <laughs> the worst would be like, you know, if he saw like, me right now and i'm just like freestyling it i think that would be the worst because at least like it looks like i'm moving towards something which is nice <laughs> oh totally and so then what kind of advice do you wish you got then though like you were at the ideation phase like 
is it kind of advice on getting your first sale that you would have wanted or what kind of advice do you wish you could have given just, yourself? Just do it. Like I think just I think a big problem um in university um early on is that a lot of the time people will kind of make you sit there and fill out, you know, your business plan, um fill out, you know, every small detail about how you think the business is going to be run. Um, figure out everything about it. I think you got to do less of that and just more of picking up a phone and, and talking to someone and doing something to make sure that you're actually moving towards the goal. Because I think a lot of people get caught up in the theoretical of it and just thinking that you can build a great business on paper. But I think in reality, there's a lot more things that got to go right. And the biggest thing a lot of the time is like, how can you even prove that what you're doing is is on the right path so if you just kind of sit there and and you're just writing things all day if you have a fundamental problem in one of your strategies or or the way that you think you're going to get a customer then everything after that is wrong as well right so even like when you raise money in, in silicon valley or anywhere it's really based off a slide deck these days because everybody knows that things are going to change and whatever assumptions you made at the beginning a lot of them are probably wrong so just like try something, test it. If it works, great, figure out the next problem. If it doesn't work, then think about why it went wrong, right? Rather than just kind of sitting there and asking a bunch of people who haven't started the companies themselves a lot of the time, right? Like I think a lot of people that are looking at your business plan um, haven't gone through that early stage struggle of trying to get that first customer or building something that somebody might use. And so, I mean, you know, what feedback are you getting from who is, is obviously a very important thing that you got to be considering. Perfect. That's a great advice. And it's like, all right, man, this is a really fun conversation. So I'm really happy you agreed to come on. And yeah, thanks for doing it, even, in, you know, all the way here in Toronto. <laughs> no, man, I appreciate it. I mean, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and it, it's cool to, you know, reconnect in a different city in the world. And hopefully next time it'll be in New York, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story with the guests, my man. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcasts. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way, and included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.